Welcome to my lecture review on the Practical Malware Analysis Guide. Here we're looking at Chapter 1, which is the Basic Static Analysis. This is the second chapter in this review process so far. Alright, so let's jump right in. Techniques for detecting malicious material typically fall in three major categories. Antivirus, scanning typically, not so much an antivirus scanning, but it's actually an antivirus analysis. Hash values, and lastly, it's more coding, which will be the strings, the functions, and the headers. So the first major technique is antivirus scanning. And that's going to be using something like the VirusTotal website, where you can actually upload uh, suspicious files or URLs or anything else and it will quickly detect any viruses, worms, trojans and major types of malware especially if they have known signatures so if you suspect a file of being malicious drop it here and run your analysis and it will let you know if it is or not this is actually one of the labs we're doing in class to show what you should be doing this is one of the best and quickest ways to, uh, to see if files are malicious. Moving on is hashing. Here, uh, keep in mind that hashing is a algorithm process where you can take a file or an item or an object and you can run it through an algorithm and it will give you a specific hash value. Part of this deals with the fingerprinting of malware. Also, you can talk about how every file is going to have a unique hash value. And so as you start manipulating or adding bits or removing bits, the hash value also does change. Common ones for hashing is MD5 or SHA-1 slash SHA-256. Realistically, SHA-1 is going away, so we should be looking at the newer versions of SHA. So why do we do hashing? Because you can take any size file, large or small, and we can narrow it down to a fixed length fingerprint. And it makes it a lot easier to analyze, so you don't have to worry about if it's a large file or not. Also, it will uniquely identify a file, so it kind of makes it a little bit easier. An important thing to realize is when we look at the hash values of two different files, they will be unique. Very rarely are they uh, common. And if they are common, that is referred to as a collision. And that's where two different files, two different data structures, two different objects have the same hash value. And again, this is rare. In one of our labs, we're looking at hash calc. And so you can actually take any type of file and you can run an MD5, SHA-1, or SHA-256 hash value against it to see the hash values. I always like this because we talk about hash values, but we never show people how to calculate them. In this example, we're looking at a PCAP file just, just because. You can actually do hash values against anything. This allows us to label a malware file because once we know that hash and we know that file, we can actually start spreading, hey, this hash value actually is an infected file. And that kind of helps build anti-malware signatures because that's a known malware hash now. Also, this hash values allow us to search online to see if someone else has already identified it, whether good or bad. Next is going to be more of the programming aspect of things. Here we're uh, looking at specifically strings. Interesting enough, a string is a sequence of printable characters. Keep in mind, not all characters on a keyboard are printable. Control, Shift, those are not printable characters. Strings are terminated by a null, which is a 0x00, zero zero zero, 
hexadecimal number, and typically we see two types of strings. ASCII, also known as ANSI, and that's 8 bits long, or we have Unicode, sometimes referred to as wide characters, and they're 16 bits long. So when we're looking at an array of texts, it does matter. Here, notice B in ASCII is 42. That's 8 bits. 4 and 2. That's hexadecimal. Where, with Unicode, it's 16 bits. 4 and 2, because 4 bits for the 4, 4 bits for the 2, 4 bits for the 0, 4 bits for the other 0. Because this is going to separate in groups of 16. So here we notice 16 blocks. If they're not separated in 16 blocks, you're going to notice... Like here there's 16, 16, 16, that's where these dotted lines are. A null with Unicode should be a double null, which that would be these two right here. But if we're not sure if we're separating them into groups of 16, isn't this two double zeros? But if we do that, that's only left with 8. So here we have 16, 16, and then 8 bits. So that's why that would not work. They're actually going to be separated 16 bits per group all the way through. One last thing is we may see it 4200, zero, zero, but when we actually see the hexadecimal, it will actually be 0x42 as the hexadecimal representation of capital B because they are different. So the string commands, they're native in Linux, and you can find them in Windows. Normally strings are groups of three characters or more, though I have seen uh, two, not three, so it kind of varies, but three is the more common. Here we actually have the strings, and we're looking for a specific string of text. It's important to realize here that the bold texts are invalid. They're, they they're just can be ignored. And that's because in this example the string is typically a short and if they're short they don't correspond to a word. So if it's not a word it's more than likely meaningless. Where the non-bold items, such as labeled on the screen, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, those are words. So they are not meaningless. Get layout, set layout, uh, gdi32.dll, or a system message. Uh, get layout, set layout are Windows functions, and uh, DLL is a dynamic link library, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Five, again, is that mail system DLL is invalid, is an error message. So those have meaning, where VP3, VW3, T$ at, those aren't real, they're strings, but they're not strings of meaning, so they can be ignored. Moving on, uh, we can talk about packed and obfuscated malware. And that's basically hidden malware. A wrapper is typically when you see small code that is unpacked when a file is ran. Basically, you can hide code into another executable, so when that executable is ran, it ex also executes the malicious or malware code. Uh, you can see wrappers, and you do ethical hacking type courses, where you can see, like, we will prepackage a uh, calculator into a text document. So when you open the text document, it also opens calculator. Normally, the code is compressed, and this makes the, the strings and instructions a lot uh, harder to read. Not so much unreadable, but we're getting close to not readable. We can detect packers with a program called PEID, 
and it will actually look at the version and it will let you kind of know what files are being packed together. It also gives you things like a file offset, an entry point, and things of that nature. Nice thing is we'll be doing a lab with this as well. If we're looking at UPX, I'm going to go back one slide. You'll notice here we're using UPX version 0.89.6. Here is UPX being ran on Kali Linux. And again, we're looking at a... Uh, UPX is the additional file that was packed into it. I'm going to go back one more slide. This is the file being analyzed. And this is the file that was found. Don't worry, we're going to get a lot more into this in Chapter 18, where we are starting to review Packers. But I wanted to point this out because this is important now, just to show that you can pack files. And here's an example of how you develop that additional code. Because you'll see we are looking at that file. We're now looking at what it does. We are now packing it. We're now setting the appropriate permissions. And you'll even see right there where it says it was packed. That way, you can now include that file into an additional exe so that it will run. Packing obfuscated strings, you can also do this with strings. And again, strings are printable, readable characters. Keep in mind, with PEID, a lot of those plugins can uh, run the malware. And we're doing the basic static analysis, so we don't want that malware to run. So, be careful with that. Here we're looking at a PEID version 0.92, which did contain a buffer overflow that allowed the attacker to execute arbitrary code. So, it could actually manipulate the malware analyst's machine. Uh, so, make sure we're running the most current version of software. One of the last major, major things we have to discuss are what's called a PE or Portable Executable File Formats. So far, we've uh, talked about how to scan executables without regards to their format. Though, the format or the structure of a file can really tell you a lot about the program's functionality. And that's where looking at things like the Portable Executable uh, format, we can look at Windows Executables, the object code, and the DLLs. The portable executable file format is a data structure that contains the information necessary for the uh, OS, Windows, to uh, load, to manage uh, the executable, look at the wrapper executable code, keeping in mind that nearly every file with executable code that is loaded in Windows is a specific format, and that's that EXE standard. And so uh, there are some legacy formats that might appear in ransomware, but that's really rare. So PE files begin with a header, and that's one of the first things that we have to look at when we talk about it, is the header portion. Again, PE files are the executable files, objects and codes, and the appropriate DLLs. Almost, again, all Windows files are, almost all executables are Windows files because EXE is a Windows extension. The first thing we look at is that header. And the header gives us information about the code, the type of application, the required library functions. Libraries here are, again, those DLLs. And space requirements, if necessary. One of the programs we're going to look at to do that will be this Lord PE program written by Yoda. We're looking at, for in this example, 
Notepad EXE. We can see the appropriate path to the appropriate DLLs and other items. Again, we're going to look a little bit more in, de uh, in depth with this in a later chapter, but I wanted to point this out because it's important to look at the executables and the appropriate linkages or the appropriate items that have to be uh, working in tandem with the executable because these files do link with one another. Here we can actually look at the appropriate, if you click on the editor option, you can look at key areas. We're looking mainly at like things like text, data, R source, relocation, and these are gonna be offsets and flags, which we're gonna discuss here in a little bit. Again, we can also look at things like the checksum, date and time stamp. It's not important to understand every single section here, but to start getting comfortable with how we can read some of this data. Again, like the primer said, don't get too stuck with details. This is more of a intro level malware analysis. Here we're looking at the code view, we could be seeing lots of different sections. Again, you see things like the data, the dot text, the data directory, the uh, relocate option, the appropriate uh, image file header, things like that. Again, this is just an overview. There are a lot more sections in code, it's just we're, we're more introducing this. Moving on is more dealing with the linked libraries and the functions. So functions are used by a program that are stored in different programs, such as a library. A function is similar to a call. Uh, basically, a function will connect to the main executable by linking. Linking comes in three specific ways, static link, at runtime or dynamically. And a lot of people get confused here, but don't worry. We're going to talk about each one of these specifically because a lot of people don't have a programming background, so kind of understanding all of this without a programming background takes a little bit of time, but it is totally doable. Statically is rarely used for Windows. It's more common in Linux. And that's where all code from the library is copied into the executable, making that executable way larger. Uh, most commonly done things with like a load library or get process address. That's where you see a lot of, of that. You also see that very uh, similar at runtime links, the load library and get process address because there are additional functions that will be ran at the time it's executed. This is very unpopular in friendly programs, typically more common in malware, especially package or obfuscated malware, because this connects the libraries only when needed, not when the program starts. So, depending on the program and what it is doing, it may load specific functions, the common question I keep getting is, well, why would they need to load functions? Because you may have a program that has to do a specific task, and why rewrite code for running a task if they can actually just pull that from a Windows subsystem? For example, you know file save is in almost every key program. Would you want to have to rewrite that for every single program, or could you just pull that from an existing library? or get memory, or how to access the processor. All of that is items that you don't have to want to rework. It's already there, so why don't you just call it instead? The most common method is this dynamic linking, and this is where the host operating system searches for the DLL, and sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you have to manually point it to the appropriate DLL, or to the at least the appropriate directory so it can search in that directory, but this is a more common one. 
Noticing all of this gives us clues if it's uh, malicious or not. That PE header lists every uh, library and function that should be loaded or will be loaded. Their names can reveal what program does. Things like a URL download to a file typically means it's downloading something. So if you're seeing a monitor program downloading something, that should be a flag going, hey, something is not right here. Moving on is what happens when we want to start looking at executables, but we want to see kind of what's dependent. So you open up the executable, and we want to see what will it call. That's where dependency walker comes into play. When we're looking at DLLs, a normal program will access multiple DLLs, while malware typically has only a few connections. Here, if we look at service exe, we can see multiple DLLs using dependency walker. If we look at this other version, we see that there's only two DLLs there, and so red flag, this might be malware. We're going to be using dependency walker a lot, so let's go over some basics for dependency walkers. We have an import section and an export section. PI at the very top, export or E, more towards the bottom, and it will show us the appropriate hints and the appropriate functions for each individual DLL file. Don't worry, we are going to have a lab on this. Notice here, they're actually looking at the uh, lab 0101 exe, which we'll be reviewing that lab also. Common DLLs are going to be important. Things like kernel 32, ADV API, user 32, GDI 32, you can read through some of these. These are going to be common DLLs that are important. ntdll.dll, that's always a funny one. M sockets, when I tell, DLL, things like that. Again, it, DLLs are going to be important, but there's hundreds and thousands of them. So you're not expected to know every single DLL, but you are expected to know common ones or you're at least expected to know where to look up information about them. And Google actually has an expansive library of DLLs and generally what they do. When we talk about imports and exports, normally DLLs export functions. Typically, EXEs will import functions. How is the data going and coming? Both exports and imports are listed in the appropriate PE header. And uh, one of the things that the authors did say was it's rare that in EXEs, but there are a ton of exports in innocent EXEs. So just be mindful of that. This is going to be subjective because you have to keep in mind our textbook is dated, but it's still actually rated as one of the best books for entry-level malware analysis. An example of import and export, we can import user32 DLL and it uses the function set windows hook ex, which is a popular uh, way that keyloggers receive keylog input. The export would be the low-level keyboard pros and the low-level mouse pros. This will be to send the data elsewhere. Keyboard and mouse being commands being sent elsewhere. So again, red flag. It will use the register hotkey to define a specific keystroke like Control Shift P to harvest the collected data. Again, these are going to be things that we pick up over time, not kind of expecting to understand at the very beginning, but the bold are functions. Low-level keyboard, low-level mouse process, register hotkey, 
those are all functions. Let's look at an example of a packed program. These are going to be the DLLs and functions that are, that are imported from the packed program.exe. You're going to notice these are all functions. There are very few functions. All you see is the unpacker, essentially. Message box is a big one. It references two DLLs, exit process. So we're starting to see patterns now. We're starting to be able to see programs and the, the DLLs that are associated with them and then the functions that may happen in those DLLs. Now let's go ahead and let's look at the header and the sections of that PE file. The important PE sections are going to be things like the .texts, the .rdata, .data, and .rsource. The .text will be the instructions for the processor. .rdata will be the imports and exports. The .data will be the global data. And the .rsource should be the strings, icons, images, and menus. That's going to make a whole lot more sense after Chapter 3, after we've analyzed a little bit of malware. Here we can look at a PE view, and we can actually look at the image and T header. We could look at the different sections of data, the dot text, the dot data, dot R source, dot relocate, and that will give us specific types of data and values for that. Again, we're going to be looking at that in later sections. This is more of just a overview of some of the tools that we're going to be looking at. The time date stamp is important because it will show when this executable was compiled. Older programs are more likely to be known to antivirus because the longer they've been around, the longer people have analyzed them, and so older programs are typically found a lot easier. Sometimes the date is wrong, though. An example of all the Delphi programs show June 19, 1992, so the dates can be faked, even though they really shouldn't be. Here we're looking at things like the image section header. That's going to give us things like the virtual size or the size of raw data. So the virtual size will be RAM. The size of raw data will be the disk storage. And for the text section, that will normally equal or nearly always be equal. If we're looking at the PAX executable, that will show the virtual size much larger than the actual raw size. So the virtual size should be greater than the disk size. And we can see that. Here's an example of the image section header, the text file. Here we see the virtual size, A68C. And we look at the raw size, which is a 800. Zero, zero. And if we look at the side by side comparison, you'll notice that the virtual size is larger than the size of the raw data. Resource Hacker will let us actually look at the R source section. That will give us the ability to look at the strings, icons, and menu section. And that looks like this. Notice, if we look at the subsections, we can actually start seeing the appropriate code. Here we're looking at the calc.exe, and we can see the code for it. Notice this program looks like it's XP. That's because most malware analysis that we're going to be doing for this class should happen in either XP or Windows 7, because later operating systems auto-find and then kick out the malware or the files that we're trying to analyze. So XP is sadly going to be the big one that we're going to be using and or Windows 7. Also notice if we look at the image group we see the appropriate ordinal uh, names, color schemes, and we can see the appropriate icons calculated to the far right. And uh, 
yeah. Resource hack and XP seems to be a little bit more, res uh, more useful than resource hack in Windows 7. So keep in mind there is a difference between the different operating systems. If you have any questions, please leave comments below. And again, this is just an entry-level intro version of malware analysis. I'll be posting videos going over all of the uh, major programs we're going to be using a little bit later. Thank you.